Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV and also welcome back to my Linux Crash Course series. For those of you that are new to this series, what we do in the Linux Crash Course series is we go over a very important foundational concept around Linux one video at a time. And unless I let you guys know otherwise, each episode is completely standalone. In this episode in particular, what we're going to do is talk about desktop environments. I'll start off by talking about what a desktop environment is in the first place. And then after that, I'll give you some examples of some of the more popular desktop environments out there. So I'll show you GNOME, KDE Plasma, Cinnamon, and maybe I might throw in something else as well. I can't wait to get started because Linux desktop environments are really cool. But before we get to that, I need to take a moment to mention the sponsor for today's video, Linode. Linode is a cloud provider, but not just any cloud provider. They're a Linux focused cloud provider. On their platform, you can spin up your own Linux server in minutes, and they have all the distributions out there that you might want to learn, which includes, but isn't limited to, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, Rocky Linux. There's actually quite a few distributions on their platform that you could choose between, which makes Linode an especially great fit for Learn Linux TV. Their platform is a great way to get started and get your own server. Now, if you don't already have an account on Linode's platform, you can set one up quite easily by simply using the URL that you see on the screen right now, which will do two things. One, it'll get you $60 in free credit towards your new account, and that credit is good for up to 60 days. But in addition to that, it also lets Linode know that you heard about them through this channel, which actually supports the channel, and I would really appreciate that. And their platform is really awesome, not just for spinning up test servers, although yeah, it's a great solution for that. You can set up your own website, a blog, a Minecraft server, a Nextcloud server. There's all kinds of things that you could use Linode's platform for. And on my end, it's actually the official cloud provider for Learn Linux TV because every web facing service for this channel is actually using Linode. So definitely check out Linode. It's a great service. I use it myself every day. I love it. And I think you're going to like it too. Now with that out of the way, we should go ahead and start our conversation about desktop environments. And the first thing we'll talk about is what a desktop environment is in the first place. So what exactly is a desktop environment? Well, one easy way to think of a desktop environment is you could think of it as a GUI, a graphical user interface, specifically a GUI for your Linux installation. Now, at first, this might seem a little strange because if you're just getting into Linux for the very first time, it's quite possible that every operating system that you've used already had a GUI installed by default. So the fact that the GUI is a separate element within Linux might be confusing at first, but actually it's not as confusing as you might think. If you're familiar with Windows Server, for example, then you may already know that the GUI on Windows Server is actually optional. When you install Windows Server, you can actually install a version that doesn't include a GUI, much in the same way that Linux itself by default doesn't include a GUI. Linux distributions often include a GUI, a desktop environment, especially the ones that are geared more towards desktop and laptop use, those will most definitely come with a desktop environment, but server distributions, things like CentOS and a number of others, they'll often not have a desktop environment at all, which means when you install them, you'll actually have just the command line when you start it up. Ubuntu Server is a really good example of this fact. When you install Ubuntu Server, it doesn't come with a GUI. Sure, you can install a GUI on Ubuntu Server, but if you're going to do that, you may as well just install regular Ubuntu, which includes a GUI by default, specifically the GNOME desktop. Now, if you were to start reading about Linux desktop environments, it's quite possible and very likely that you might run across the word window manager as well. So what exactly is a window manager and how does it differ when you compare it to a desktop environment? Well, actually, at first, there's no real difference, but it's actually very different at the same time. So let me explain, and it's going to make a lot more sense here very shortly. A window manager is a technology that allows you to manage windows. Now, normally, if you're thinking about Microsoft Windows or Mac OS, you're probably not really going to think of a window manager because in those operating systems, it's built in. Now, similarly, when it comes to Linux desktop environments, 
Window managers are also built in. They're the mechanism through which windows are shown on your screen. Now, the reason why desktop environments and window managers are often discussed as separate things is because technically they are. You could use a window manager without using a desktop environment. You could think of a desktop environment as a GUI in every sense of the word that gives you access to things like opening applications, maybe tray icons for applications that you have hidden, a volume control, the ability to change your wallpaper, you know, all the things that you would normally think of when you think of a GUI for a desktop. But a window manager doesn't really include any of those things. A window manager is just going to give you the ability to have a window displayed on your computer. All the other things that I mentioned, you know, like volume controls and whatnot, those are actually supplied by the desktop environment. So you could think of a desktop environment as a full featured GUI. A window manager is just one component of that GUI, the component specifically that draws windows on your screen. Now, the thing is, if you were to use a window manager only and not a desktop environment, then your memory footprint goes down quite a bit because you're not loading into memory all those other controls that you might not need. So for example, if you never plan on using Wi-Fi on your computer, then why would you want a Wi-Fi manager in memory when you might not even use it? With a window manager, well, you have nothing. Now, some of them actually do have additional features. For example, OpenBox gives you the ability to launch applications. So sometimes window managers do include features that would normally be reserved for a desktop environment. But for the most part, you could think of a window manager as the core of the desktop environment and using just the window manager itself, foregoing the majority of the desktop environments out there and their features, that's absolutely possible, but that's for more advanced users because you're going to run into some issues. For example, if you log into OpenBox and you don't have the menu set up, how do you actually open applications if you have no menu, especially considering you need to launch an application to edit the menu, it becomes a chicken and egg problem that's actually easily solved if you know how to do it. But if you're a beginner, you're probably just setting yourself up for frustration. So in my opinion, it's probably better, at least for now, if you're just starting out, to stick with desktop environments. So at this point, let's go ahead and just dive into some desktop environments. What I'll do is start with GNOME. That's the next one that I'll show you. And then from there, I'll show you some additional desktop environments. And maybe by the end of this video, you'll be able to choose which one is the right one for you. Maybe by seeing me use one, one of the ones that I show you might just click and it might actually get you very excited. And if it does, maybe that'll make you wanna go out and try that desktop environment. And if that happens, and I guess my work is done here because that's the point. I wanna get you guys excited about it. And that's what I'm going to do. So let's start with GNOME. We'll start there. And then from there, we'll go ahead and check out some other desktop environments. It's going to be a lot of fun. So let's dive in. So here we have the GNOME desktop. And as an aside, I'm well aware that the word GNOME is pronounced GNOME, the G is silent, but when it comes to the desktop environment that's spelled the same way, it's actually supposed to be pronounced GNOME. And I know to some of you guys that might seem silly, but I'm not the one that decided that. The developers of the GNOME desktop have decided that the name of the desktop should be pronounced that way. So it is what it is. I'm just the messenger in this case. But on my end, out of habit, I'm just going to call it GNOME because I always kind of fall into that pronunciation anyway. But I just wanted to mention to you guys that it's pronounced GNOME in this case, even though habitually I just say GNOME. And something that you may be wondering is where are the applications? We see a panel here at the top, but how do I actually open an application? Well, actually, when we click on activities here on the upper left hand corner of the screen, that reveals the majority of the user interface that's normally hidden. So when we're here at the desktop, we have just this panel and pretty much nothing else. But once we click on activities, that's where we see the panel here at the bottom. It shows us some of the applications that were set as favorites. In this case, these are pre-selected. We could simply right click and unpin any application that we would prefer not show on this panel. But right here, we have a proper applications menu. So if we click on that, we can see all of the applications that we might have installed. So for example, I'll just open up a text editor. So here we have the official text editor for the GNOME desktop. 
But perhaps even more useful, we have this file manager right here. Every desktop environment has its own file manager or a selected file manager to serve that purpose. And here we have Nautilus, the file manager for the GNOME desktop, which has actually been renamed to files. So if we go to the about screen right here, we can see that it's now called files. I often call it Nautilus because that's been its name for quite a long time, but this is files, the file manager for the GNOME desktop. And this file manager is actually really cool. I mean, it has most of the features that you would expect a file manager to have. For example, we could change the view if you don't like the default icon view here. You could actually go to a list view. If you are actually constrained for screen space, you could actually shrink the window down and resize it just like any other window. But if we go all the way to the left here, you can see that the menu on the left actually collapses or hides as I shrink the window which makes sure that I have enough room to view the files, which is pretty cool. It's actually a feature that was recently added. And when that menu is hidden, it's actually put into an icon right here, which actually makes it pop out. So we could simply utilize that particular button if we want the menu to be hidden. But as you can see, it's actually flexible for different screen sizes or window sizes, which is pretty cool. That's just one of many tweaks that's been added to the GNOME file manager. But for the most part, the GNOME Files app is your traditional file manager. So anything related to file management, such as copying files, transferring files, or anything file related, that's all done here in the Files app. Now the GNOME desktop also includes some other applications that are very useful as well. So let's go ahead and check out some of those. So again, I could click on Activities, and then I could go here to Show Applications. But as an aside, I can also get to the activity screen by just pressing the super key, which is also known as the Windows logo key. That way I don't have to reach all the way up here to get to activities. I can simply press the super key. But anyway, I'll go ahead and show applications and let's check out some of the applications here. So we have the system monitor. The system monitor just shows you how busy your system is. So you can see all the CPUs I have on this desktop, how much memory I have some graphs that show you how busy your CPU and memory is respectively. And you can also get a list of processes that are running on your system. You can check the status of your file systems to see if your disk is in danger of becoming full, for example. So for anything related to system resources, the system monitor built-in application right here is actually a really good one. And let's check out another application. In fact, the next one that I want to check out is right here in the panel down here at the bottom. This is GNOME Software. So if you want to install a new application, then GNOME Software is going to be the way that you go about doing that on most distributions that use GNOME. Some of them actually opt for a completely different solution. But most GNOME desktops will use GNOME Software. And that's what we have right here. So we can find a new application by just going through the different categories here or by searching. If we know the name of the application that we want to install, we can simply just type it in right here. So for example, I'd like to install Firefox. So I'll just go ahead and click on that. And now we have an option to install it. So I'll do that. I'll click install. And now it's installing. So as you can see, the GNOME software app is really easy to use. You just find the application that you want to install and then click install. It doesn't really get any simpler than that. And now we have Firefox installed on our system. So if I go back to the Activities Overview, and then go here to Show Applications, as you can see, when you install applications through GNOME software, it even goes ahead and adds an icon for that application in your app menu. If you want to add an application as a favorite, or you want to pin the application, you can right-click on it, and then you can pin it to the dash which is this little panel right here. As you can see, we now have a Firefox icon. So that's pretty cool. But anyway, let's go ahead and check out another application. In fact, let's go ahead and check out the GNOME web browser, simply called web. So yeah, the GNOME desktop actually has its own web browser that's installed by default. Not every distribution will have this installed by default, but if your distribution features the GNOME desktop at all, then in most cases, the GNOME web browser is going to be available to you. So you could go ahead and install it if it's not already installed. And here it is. As you can see, it's a fairly simplistic web browser. But at this point, I have a lot going on on my screen. I have three applications that are open on this particular workspace. So it's getting a little busy, isn't it? 
So what I'll do is segue into workspaces. I think this is the perfect time to show you guys workspaces. It's actually my favorite feature when it comes to GNOME. To be fair, workspaces aren't unique to GNOME. Every desktop environment out there has support for workspaces. They might name it something different like virtual desktops, but what's unique when it comes to GNOME is how GNOME handles workspaces, which actually is the most unique implementation of workspaces of any user environment that I've ever used. And you've already seen some of this. So for example, when I press the super key and I go to the activities overview, you can see that I get an overview of all the applications that are open on this workspace. One of the reasons why this is so useful is because if I have an application behind another, let's say for example, I have this here and this here. Now those apps are actually hidden behind this GNOME web window. Anyway, if I press the super key, I can immediately see all of the applications that are open on that workspace, including any of those that were behind another one. But that's actually just the beginning. If I go over here to the right, we see what looks like another workspace. If I click on it, sure enough, that's exactly what it is. So let's click on it. And now here I am with an empty workspace. If I press the super key again, then I could just go over here to the original desktop and go back to that one. And I can flip back and forth between those workspaces. An easier method to navigate between workspaces is to hold Control and Alt on your keyboard. And while you're holding those down, you can press left or right to move to the desktop on the left or the desktop on the right. So you can move between workspaces by using just your keyboard. That's pretty cool. Now watch what happens when I open an application on this workspace. So let's go ahead and open up a file manager again. And here we have it. So watch what happens when I press the super key again. We have another workspace. Well, that's interesting. What happens if I close this application? And by the way, it's pretty cool that you could close an application without actually having to focus on the application. So let's just go ahead and close it. Notice that this other desktop went away. If I click on the application again or launch any application for that matter, what we'll get is a brand new empty desktop. And that'll just keep happening. Every time I open an application, I get a new empty workspace. And this is known as dynamic workspaces. That's what this is called. GNOME features dynamic workspaces, which is a really cool implementation of this idea. Now, of course, GNOME didn't invent this idea by any stretch, but I feel like they've perfected it. At the very least, I find it very helpful. Anyway, now we're down to one extra workspace and we have our original. So GNOME works best when you have one or a few applications per workspace. So for example, perhaps I could consider this workspace my system management workspace. And that makes sense because I have an application here that manages software applications or what's installed on the system. And then I have a resource viewer here, but this web browser is a bit out of place because maybe I might wanna do some research in that web browser. So let's just drag it over to another workspace. How cool was that? I was able to reorganize the applications on these workspaces by simply dragging them to another workspace. So now I have a dedicated workspace right here for managing my system so I can install applications here. And then here in the resource monitor, the GNOME system monitor, I can actually monitor the impact that applications have on the system. But as a user, I could basically lay this out any way that I'd like. Now, next, let's talk about customization when it comes to GNOME. So if I go to Activities and then Applications again, we have an app here called Settings, which gives you access to, big surprise, Settings. And I feel like this is one of the better Settings apps out there. It's very well organized, so it's really simple to know where you should go. I mean, if you're looking to connect to a Wi-Fi network, for example, well, you probably wouldn't be doing a disservice to yourself by clicking on the Wi-Fi option right here on the left-hand side. So as you can see, these things are named very intelligently. So you have settings here for configuring your display, mouse, keyboard, and so on. Now, one thing that you'll probably notice is that if you've used other desktop environments, the GNOME desktop doesn't have nearly as many customization options when you compare it to something like the Plasma desktop. 
And some people might actually consider GNOME inferior to other desktop environments because they might prefer more customization options. GNOME is a desktop for people that want more of a turnkey solution. You get all the essential tweaks here. So for example, you could go to Appearance right here, and you could choose a different wallpaper. So that's an essential setting, and you absolutely have that here. But when it comes to things that are more advanced than that, then you're just going to get the essential features here, not anything that's going to truly stand out as amazing. The GNOME desktop is basically designed to be a tried and true default desktop for Linux if you don't have any other preference. So if your preference is Plasma, you can go ahead and go that direction. You could check out Cinnamon or any of the other desktop environments. But if you just want something that's a set it and forget it desktop environment or something that is simpler when it comes to customization, then the GNOME desktop is a good fit. Now, another thing that I would like to touch on is that your experience with the GNOME desktop, if you decide to try a Linux distribution that includes the GNOME desktop, might be a lot different than what you're seeing here. More than any other desktop environment, GNOME sometimes sees a lot of customization by the Linux distribution developers themselves. And in some cases, they'll include so many tweaks that GNOME is barely recognizable. Let's take a look at Ubuntu, for example. Ubuntu also uses the GNOME desktop by default, but as you can see here, it looks a lot different, doesn't it? In fact, we even have a panel on the left-hand side, and that panel was not present in GNOME itself. That's something that Ubuntu added to their implementation of GNOME that's not normally present in GNOME. Now, in GNOME, what we could do, like you saw me do many times now, is press the super key or click on activities, and that reveals a panel here at the bottom of the screen. The mindset when it comes to GNOME's developers is to get as much of the UI out of your face as it possibly can when you're working with applications and hide most of those UI elements underneath the activities overview. And I like that personally because it keeps the majority of everything out of your way. You have the majority of the screen for your applications, and that's a great thing. Ubuntu decided to go a different way. You have a panel on the screen, so that's a custom Ubuntu tweak. And in addition to that, they also have a custom theme. So for example, if I open up the file manager here on GNOME 43, and then I do the same thing on Ubuntu, you can immediately see the difference between the two. Ubuntu's developers actually create a very custom theme for their implementation of GNOME, and that could be confusing for somebody who's a newcomer that tries out GNOME on, let's say, Fedora, which gives you a more pristine GNOME experience, and then that individual goes to use Ubuntu. And even though both of them are GNOME distributions, the experience is very different, but that's just because a lot of the developers out there that maintain Linux distributions, they often add their own tweaks and special sauce to their implementation. It's normal, a little bit confusing, but it's still normal. So anyway, let's go ahead and check out another desktop environment. So you just saw the GNOME desktop environment. Now let's check out the Plasma desktop environment. And here it is in all its glory. Now, if your first impression is or was that this desktop environment looks a lot like Microsoft Windows, then I could totally understand where you're coming from. In fact, when I first started, the Plasma desktop was then known as the Windows-like desktop environment. And the reason for that is because like Microsoft Windows, or at least versions before 11, we have a start menu equivalent here on the bottom left-hand corner, which is a lot like the start menu. So if you click on this, we have a list of all of our applications here. We could also access places, and this menu shows some common locations around your system for easy access. And then we also have access to place the computer into suspend mode. We could also restart it, we could shut down, and we could click the button right here to log out of our session if we want to go ahead and end our session. Here on the panel, we have several icons that are there by default. And in case you were curious, I'm using Kubuntu to show you the KDE Plasma desktop. But these applications are not running, but if I was to click on one of them, let's say for example, Firefox, We can now see that the icon has changed a little bit. And to further elaborate on that, I'll open up the default file manager here. 
So as you can tell, the applications that are running have a little box around them. The one in front actually has a colored background and the one that is not in front doesn't. So to be honest, yeah, there's some definite similarities compared to Windows, but then again, the Plasma desktop kind of went their own direction with a lot of things too. So this isn't a ripoff of Windows, but I guess you could possibly consider this desktop as being inspired by Windows. If nothing else, if you're coming from Windows, then the Plasma desktop environment might be a great fit for you for that reason alone. Now, Firefox isn't specific to KDE Plasma, so I'll go ahead and close that. And what we're seeing right here is the default file manager, which is called Dolphin. And while the name might be a little strange, at least for a file manager, the Dolphin file manager is considered by many Linux users to be among the best. This file manager has been around for a very, very long time. So it's definitely had a lot of time to pick up some new features. But for the most part, all the features that you would expect from a file manager are here. And I would even go as far as to say that Dolphin is among the most featureful file managers that are available today. So let's just have a click around then. So right now we have the default icon view and just like most file managers, we could zoom in or zoom out. And I really like how when you zoom all the way in, you can see that the icons still appear very clear. They're not pixelated or blurry or anything like that. So you can clearly see that they put a lot of detail into these icons. But this is a bit too large for me. So let's just go ahead and lower that down. And another thing that I'll show you is that you can set up different views for the file manager. So here we have what's basically kind of like a list view, but it doesn't have as many options as a list view might normally have. So let's check out this one. Now this is really cool. Now we have not only a list view that has proper columns here, but it's actually a tree view as well, which I really like that kind of view in a file manager. It really helps to understand the file system layout when you have it in a tree view, because you could easily see the relation of subdirectories to their parent directory. So let's go here and go to the configuration option and we'll configure the Dolphin file manager itself. And what you're going to see here is that we have a lot of options. And this is one of those things that Plasma users really like about their favorite desktop environment. They really enjoy the amount of customization that they have available. Now, of course, you could ignore all of these settings and just use it as is. You don't have to configure anything. If the default layout is fine for you, then you could just leave it well enough alone. But if you wanna get in there and go deep with the customization, then Plasma will absolutely have you covered. We haven't even gotten to the point yet where we started configuring the desktop environment itself. So if the settings that we have here in Dolphin are any indication of the amount of control that we have over this desktop environment, well, we're in for a real treat. I'll go ahead and close this out for now. If you wanna check out the settings in Dolphin yourself, then I'll leave it up to you to try out Plasma and go ahead and play around with that. But let's go around the desktop a little bit further and see why everyone seems to like Plasma so much. Now I've already gone over the launcher right here, the application launcher. As you can see, it's very self-explanatory. But we also have some controls over here. So if I click on the date and time, you can see the current date today is the 27th. I guess it'll be interesting to see how long it takes for me to get this video edited and out to you guys. Normally it could take anywhere from one to three months before you see a video on my channel because of the production that I put into these videos. But anyway, we get a neat little calendar here. If we click on the up arrow here, it shows another menu that has some quick icons to various things that we might want to have quick access to. KDE Connect is not something that I'm going to show you in today's video, but I wanted to point it out because what that allows you to do is receive notifications from your smartphone if you have that paired to your desktop. That may or may not be something that you're interested in. Maybe you don't want the distraction or Maybe you might be looking for a very important notification and you might not want to miss that notification. If that's the case, then you can enable this. We have access to the clipboard, power management. There's also a section for notifications. I don't currently have any notifications right now. I could check the do not disturb box if I would prefer not to be bothered. You know, if I'm recording a video, for example, I might not want to see any pop-ups come up on the screen until I'm done. So for me, do not disturb mode is extremely useful. Continuing, we have a device menu here. And if I click on that, 
we can see the flash drives that I have attached to the system currently. So I'm using Ventoy to show you this right now. Normally I actually install everything right on the hardware. I'm trying live mode right now because nothing that I'm going to go over in this video is system specific, but we do have a Ventoy USB attached. I plan on making a video about Ventoy if I haven't already done so. Just check my video list to see if that's out. It's a really cool application. I highly recommend that you check that out. But anyway, this menu right here gives you quick access to flash drives and things like that. So that's a good thing to have. We have quick access to Bluetooth as well. Also our volume controls. So if we want to change the output device, we can easily do that here. You can see which applications are utilizing the sound card. They'll be listed here if you are playing audio from any of the devices. I'm not currently playing audio, but you get the point. So this is a really cool menu to have right here. And this is a show desktop button. So if I was to bring up, I don't know, Dolphin again, and you can see that clicking this button right here minimizes every application that I might have open. Now, when it comes to installing new applications, the Plasma desktop has you covered there as well. Right here on the panel, we have an icon for the Discover app which is basically the Plasma equivalent of the GNOME software app that you saw earlier. So it serves the same purpose. If I click on it, what we could do is click on applications and we could drill down through these categories. And what you'll find is that there's actually quite a few applications available for installation. Actually, however many applications your distribution has available for installation is however many applications you'll have available right here. What the Discover app does is it just curates the applications that are available for your particular distribution and exposes them here in this app for you to install. So as you can see, I have a list of games. There's actually quite a few here, and some of these are a lot of fun. Anyway, I just click the back button a few times here to get to the main screen. Another thing that you can do with the Discover app is install updates. Now, I actually just started this particular Plasma installation today. It's running in live mode, actually, so I'm not going to install updates, but if you had this installed on your actual hardware, like I normally do, then you can actually just go through and install all of your updates. So since I have 335 updates, that would be a good thing to take care of, but since I'm running in live mode, I won't worry about that. If I was to install this, I would absolutely want to also install these updates. But anyway, when it comes to installing new applications or updating existing applications, then the Discover app is the way that you do that in the Plasma desktop environment. Now, when I go to settings, we have a bunch of settings. And I touched on this earlier in this section when I showed you the Dolphin file manager. Dolphin itself has a bunch of tweaks that you can make within that app. But these settings here are specific to the entire desktop environment. So for example, I could turn on dark mode and to make it more dramatic, I'll just bring the Dolphin file manager back up onto the screen and I'll change it back to the default view. Let's go ahead and enable dark mode. And now we've enabled dark mode. How cool is that? Now, something that's really, really cool about the Plasma desktop is that you can actually edit the animation speed of the various things in the desktop. So for example, when I go here and click on the application launcher, it's going to kind of slide into view. It happens pretty quick. It feels responsive, but let's go ahead and just crank this up a little bit. Let's make our desktop even faster. Now you can see that opening the applications menu is a lot faster now. And it's not just that one thing that gets faster. What I've done is I've configured the animation speed for the entire desktop environment, so I should notice speed improvements pretty much everywhere. Now again, Plasma is very performant. You shouldn't have to do this, but if you want it to feel like it's lightning quick, then increasing the animation speed is a great way to do that. Now I'm not going to go through all of the settings and toggles and tweaks that are available here in the System Settings app. As you can see, there's quite a bit of things here that you can configure. I'll leave it up to you to do that if that's something that you wanted to do if you were to try out the Plasma desktop. And I highly recommend that you do try out the Plasma desktop. In fact, I recommend that you try out all of the desktop environments that I'm going through in this video. 
But I think the things that I've gone over so far when it comes to plasma is going to give you a basic overview of what plasma is. And I think that should be good enough for now. So let's go ahead and try out another desktop environment. Another of the more popular desktop environments is the Cinnamon desktop environment. This particular desktop environment is made famous by the Linux Mint distribution, which is among the most popular distributions of Linux, especially when it comes to beginners. So this particular desktop environment is actually somewhat specific to Linux Mint, although there's nothing stopping people from installing it on a different distribution. And some distributions have actually started featuring Cinnamon on their distro, with Debian being a very good example of that. So Cinnamon, although somewhat specific to Linux Mint, is something that you can actually get on other distros, but it might not be as available as, say, Plasma or the GNOME desktop environment, but it's still really cool. So let's go ahead and check it out and see what all the buzz is about when it comes to Cinnamon. And here it is. Here's Cinnamon in all its glory. So what I've done on my end is I've installed Linux Mint 21 specifically the Cinnamon Edition, so that I could show you an installed version of Cinnamon, which I think is going to actually run a lot better because Cinnamon benefits from hardware acceleration, something that you might not have by default until you install the NVIDIA driver, for example, if your computer has an NVIDIA GPU. Cinnamon might actually crash if you don't have GPU acceleration, but that doesn't mean that this is a slow and unresponsive desktop environment. It just means that Cinnamon has been developed to utilize the GPU whenever it makes sense to do so. So for that reason, it's recommended for those of you that have a more capable computer. If your computer is quite old or you don't really have a GPU that's really all that great, then you might want to consider one of the other desktop environments. But then again, the Cinnamon desktop environment might surprise you. Even if your computer is a bit older, it might work just fine. So you might just want to give it a shot and see how it runs on your hardware. Now, at first glance, you might be mistaken and think that I'm actually showing you Plasma. I mean, it kind of does look like Plasma at first, considering the default layout that you see here. For example, we have an application launcher here. We also have icons on the panel. We have system controls here on the right-hand side of that panel. We also have desktop icons. But actually, this couldn't be less related to Plasma because this is a completely different desktop environment. And as I show you around the desktop, you'll see that it is actually a desktop environment of its own. And actually, if I click on the application launcher here, you can see that it is a little bit similar to the Plasma application launcher. We don't have the categories down here, but it is your basic application launcher and it gets the job done. Anyway, continuing with my look here at the Cinnamon desktop environment, let's just click around and explore it a bit. One thing I will mention before we do that is that I'm not going to cover anything that's specific to Linux Mint in this section. I'm going to actually focus on the Cinnamon desktop itself. Down here, we have several icons. So if I bring up the file manager and then I click right here to show the desktop, you can see that it does exactly that. And interesting enough, I have the update manager that actually popped up on the screen. Let's just go ahead and close that. So as you can see, the show desktop icon does exactly that. You click on it and it drops everything down to the panel. Click on it again and it restores the windows where they were before you clicked on it. So that's pretty simple too. Now let's spend some time and actually talk about this file manager. And this file manager, the file manager for the Cinnamon desktop is the Nemo file manager. We can see some information about it right here. Now Nemo is not a file manager that can compare to Dolphin when it comes to the number of tweaks and customization settings that you have access to, but it actually has quite a few options in and of itself. It's just really hard to compare to Dolphin because it probably has the most customization options, but Nemo is no slouch either. I would actually rate it as having more customization options than compared to GNOME files, but less than Dolphin. So it's somewhere in the middle. By default, we have our icon view here and we have a list view available as well. So as you can see, we have different options here. We can also click right here and that'll give us a tree view in the panel on the left-hand side. I'll go back to the icon view. We can hide the panel completely by clicking that icon. 
and we can unhide it. If we go up here to edit and then preferences, you can start to see some of the things that this file manager allows you to configure. So as you can see here, we can set the default view for new folders that we open up through the Nemo application. I'm going to leave mine on icon view. We could also tell it to inherit the view type of the parent folder, which is pretty cool actually. So you could have different views for individual folders. That's pretty cool as well. We could also set the default zoom levels. In the behavior section, we have additional options such as what happens when you click on executable files. We can also enable or disable the confirmation that might appear when we go ahead and delete files. So if you'd like a warning to show up, you can select that right here. If we scroll down, we have media handling. We have an option for bulk rename. And it just sets which application handles that for us. Display options. So if I wanted to show the full path in the title and tab bars, for example, I could definitely do that. And let's close that and see if this takes effect immediately. Doesn't seem like it does, but let's go ahead and open that back up. Well, actually it looks like it was already showing that. I just had to expand it, but you get the idea. But I don't want to spend too much time on this right here because it's a file manager. So if you've ever used a file manager, which is probably going to be the vast majority of everyone watching this video, I think you are well aware of what a file manager does. And in my opinion, Nemo is a really good file manager. Now, just like other desktop environments, we have workspaces available here as well. I forgot to show you that in the Plasma section, but Plasma also has that feature. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, pretty much every desktop environment has workspaces in some form or fashion. It's a little bit more hidden here in the Cinnamon desktop, but if I hold Control and Alt and press Up, and with that, you can see how the workspace implementation is when it comes to Cinnamon. Now, one thing that I really, really love about the Cinnamon desktop is the ability to rename workspaces. So for example, right here, we have workspace one, check that out, I could rename it. So for example, I could actually set this to mail, maybe email related shenanigans go on with this workspace. If I'm developing something, I might wanna do that on a workspace dedicated for development. And right here, maybe I'll have a workspace that's dedicated to web browsing. But all work and no play, that's not a good thing. So we need a workspace for games as well. If we want to add additional workspaces, we simply click the plus icon here. And what I'll do is just close this one and go back to four. And just like any other desktop environment, you open the workspace switcher. Again, control alt up in this case and then you can select a different workspace. Now down here on the panel, we could right click here, then we could click on panel edit mode, and then we'll go to applets, and I'll scroll down here, we should have a workspace switcher. So I'll go ahead and add that to the panel, and here it is. And we have some settings associated with that workspace switcher as well, so I'll click there. Type of display, we drop that down. We have simple buttons, so it shows just the number. Or we can have a visual representation as well. So we don't have a great deal of settings here, but we have a few, so that's pretty cool. And I like having the workspaces shown right here on the panel. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's not there by default, at least in the Linux Mint implementation of Cinnamon. But if it's not there on yours as well, and that's something that you'd like to have, then you can add the applet to the panel and that should work out just fine. Anyway, let's close this. And then I'll right click and disable edit mode because that's all I wanted to do. And now I can actually switch between my workspaces as you can see here. Now I know the ability to name workspaces may not seem like all that big of a deal, but when you consider that most desktop environments actually don't allow you to do that, especially GNOME, I don't really know why GNOME doesn't allow you to do that, then this is a feature that I wish every desktop environment had because I would absolutely love the ability to label workspaces. I think some people might actually be more efficient if they have a designated workspace for a specific project or a particular activity. So for example, if I was working on a client project, 
I could create a dedicated workspace just for that. So maybe I'm helping out client one, and maybe I'm also working on something for client two as well. And now that I have a workspace dedicated for that particular project, then I could just open up whatever applications I would like to open for that purpose and have them all on a dedicated workspace. I think that makes a lot of sense. Now what I'll do is just go ahead and activate panel edit mode again. Then we'll go ahead and find the workspace switcher. I'm just going to set everything back to the default so you can continue to see Cinnamon as the developers intended, the default settings, if you will. So we have the workspace switcher right here. I'll go ahead and remove it. And now it's gone. And then I'll close edit mode. Now, another thing that I like about Cinnamon is that although it doesn't have the same level of customization options as compared to Plasma, for example, it actually has a great deal of customizations. So if I open up the Control Center, which is this right here, we can start to see some of the options that we have available. So let's go to Themes. And for a dramatic effect, I'll just open up a file manager here. Let's go back to Icon Mode. And what I'll do is actually change the icon color to something else. If you prefer blue, for example, then you have several options. So as you can see, the icons are now an aqua color. We could select a light theme or a dark theme. So if I wanted to match the icon theme and I wanted a dark theme, then I could select that option. You can also change the mouse pointer. We have different desktop themes. So I could choose a different color scheme by choosing one of these. And the changes are going to be subtle, but for the most part, the panel is going to mirror the settings of the selections that I've made here. So you have some options here for customizing the color scheme, which is really great. Something that I hope every desktop environment gets at some point or another, because the default colors of a desktop environment might not appeal to you personally. And if that's the case, it's really great to be able to change the color scheme. And of course we have other options that we can play around with as well. But for the most part, the Cinnamon desktop environment is really great. Now again, you might have some issues if you have a GPU, for example, that's not quite up to task. If your GPU was made in the last five years or probably longer, then I'm guessing it's fine. But in the case of Nvidia, you'll also need the Nvidia driver installed as well. But when it comes to Cinnamon, as long as you meet the minimum requirements, it's actually a really good desktop, and I highly recommend that you check it out. All right, so there you go. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. If you did, then please click that like button to let YouTube know that you've enjoyed this video, and that'll help ensure we see more Linux-related content here on YouTube. As always, thank you so much for checking out this channel and checking out this video. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again very soon.